a letter to a church in one of the most influential cities of the ancient world. From the most influential apostle ever known. A man who had never even met many of the believers to whom he wrote. This letter lays the foundation for their faith, for our faith, and explains how a people entrapped in sin and slavery could be reconciled to the perfect, just, and righteous God of the universe. This letter that became a biblical book that has shaped church history perhaps more than any other. This is Paul's letter to the Romans. Well, good morning and welcome to North Point Church. Man, I love this church and getting to meet with y'all every single week. Uh, My name is Jay Quick and I'm on staff here at the church and we are back in our Roman series this week. We celebrated Easter last week, the resurrection of our King and Savior of which we found in Romans 3, which was really good because before that, um, not a ton of great news uh, like uh, sermons about how our culture is crumbling and how it gets to the crumbling point, uh, sermons about God's wrath, his sin, our sin, his judgment. Um, And then we have this awesome a message that we are justified by his blood. Like what an amazing promise. Uh, fast forwarding to Romans chapter four, uh, we're in our Roman series here, and um, Paul tells us, man, I'd love for you to emulate uh, this one guy's faith. Um, and he points all the way back to the origin of our faith journey. He talks about this guy named Abraham, and he calls him the forefather of our faith, like our spiritual grandfather, because everything goes back to start with him. And if you think about some of like the most influential people like ever to walk the face of the earth, we have to think about Jesus and consider him, all uh, right? But um, besides Jesus, Abraham's got to be up there. Uh, think about that for a moment. Uh, Paul calls him the spiritual forefather of our faith. And when you talk to a, a Christian, Abraham's central to our faith, but not just Christians. The Jews uh, in Judaism look to Abraham at the foundations of their faith. And even if you talk to a Muslim, uh, if you say, hey, tell me more about your faith, what you believe in, uh, what you practice, and they're gonna get back to the origin of their faith and they're gonna point towards Abraham. And so literally billions of people around the earth living here and out today have their faith and their everyday worldview shaped by this guy, Abraham. Um, Now, we believe different things than the Muslims do and the Jews may believe, but um, similarly, we all have a rooted story from Abraham, and we find that back in Genesis. And so we're going to just kind of give a 30,000-foot view of a little bit of Abraham because Paul's whole argument in Romans 4 is built around Abraham. So if you're with me, you can flip to Romans 12 in your Bible. Uh, We'll kind of just do a quick overview of a bunch of chapters in a row there. Um, But Abraham's name, it started as Abram. Abram uh, meant this name, Exalted Father, which uh, is a cool name, uh, except can you imagine like running around the playground in kindergarten and maybe getting like rubbed, like, dude, look at that, Exalted Father's coming our way, you know, getting poked a little bit for that as he grew up, probably a little bit, Um, into his teenage years, 20s, 30s, probably the question, wow, uh, nice to meet you, what's your name? Oh, I'm Abram, Uh, Exalted Father, wow. Like, I'm a dad too, how many kids do you have? Um, I, I don't have any kids. Abram would reply and, oh, shoot, I was going to ask you, you know, wisdom for parenting. He didn't have any. So 20s and 30s and 40s, getting asked this question. Now in his 50s, it's, oh, exalted father. Like, like how many grandchildren do you have? He's like, I, I, don't, I don't have any children. I, I have no children in my household. Um, it probably got to the place where Abram would go to the markets and he'd probably wrestle with this, like, ah, oh, God, pl- just please don't leave and let him ask my name. Like, I just don't want to have to have that conversation, that pain and that burden in my life. Like, I am Abram, the exalted father. I have no children. Uh, That'd be a hard thing to wrestle through. So that's kind of where Abram is at. Genesis 12, Paul calls, uh, excuse me, not Paul, God calls Abram and he says, hey, I want you to follow me. And we see some really cool promises that I want to trace through the next few chapters in scripture. Genesis 12, 2, he says, Abram, I'm going to make a great nation from you. Even though you have no sons at 75 years old from you and your lineage, there's going to be a great nation that comes from you. Genesis 12, 3, um, you're going to be a blessing to all peoples. All peoples on the earth, you are going to bless. So not only are you going to have a great nation, it's going to go way bigger than that, beyond cultural boundaries, geographic boundaries, country boundaries. Like this is going to bless everybody, all nations through you. I know you don't have children yet, but Abraham, or Abram, trust me, like this is what the plan is. Genesis 12, 7, all this land that you see, you will have. And so Abram gets these promises and he's called to leave the place where he's familiar with, uh, Haran, 
And he's asked to go out into the desert, go out into Canaan and follow God there. This is radical faith. Because all of your wealth in this day and age, it was tied to where you were. You might have livestock, you might have your business, your career, your inheritance was gonna come from your father who was in typically that region. Here now today, we see things like, yeah, my son and daughter moved out to Florida. Um, my my uh, nephew and niece, they moved out to Orlando or Colorado or California. Like we, that's very independent American culture. That didn't happen very often here. This is radical faith for Abram to go out on this promise. So he leaves the land that he's familiar with. In Genesis 13, there's this cool scene where God says to Abram, man, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east and look to the west. Everywhere you see, all of this land is going to be yours. What a promise. Fast forwarding um, Genesis 14, just for time's sake, getting to Genesis 15, we see the beginning of kind of this covenant forming with God. And a covenant is a promise, and not just like a contract promise that we might have that you can find with a lawyer, like some loopholes. You're like, well, it worked for a while and then we're out of that promise. Like a covenant with God is a done and set deal. Genesis 5, uh, 15, four and five, we see this promise. I will give you a son and your descendants will be as numerous as the stars. If you've been out in the desert or out of the city and you see how many stars there are, I mean, it's glorious to think it's countless stars. He's saying, Abram, your descendants will be as countless as the stars. I know you don't have a child yet, but keep the faith. This is what's gonna happen through you. And an interesting thing takes place at the end of Genesis 15. Um, he wants to make a sign uh, kind of for this covenant and, and make this thing official. And so he provides some sacrifices and Abram prepares these sacrifices, these various animals. And uh, he causes Abram to fall asleep. And while Abram's asleep, these animals are like filleted in two and the presence of God comes and it passes right through these filleted animals. His, his presence is right through them and the significance is this. In the, in, the old te- in the Old Testament, in those days when a covenant was being formed between two parties, both parties would end up walking through the sacrifice that they'd fillet open, one on each side, these body parts all over the place, probably didn't smell good, but they're walking through this thing and it's as if they're saying, God, do unto me as I've done unto these animals if I don't hold up my end of the deal. If I don't hold my end of the covenant, God, just kill me now, fillet me open, split me in two and kill me. Like that's how serious a covenant was. And here we have God He's the only one who passes through this covenant because he's going, Abram, this is how serious I am. Like I promise this is gonna come. And it's as if he doesn't make Abram go through that because he knows that he's not really gonna keep his end of the bargain. Genesis 16, we go forward and that's exactly the case. Genesis 16, we see Abram and his wife Sarah, they're getting restless. Uh, This time they're in their 80s, no children, the promised son, the great nation, it has not come yet and so his wife Sarah says, hey, would you sleep with our maidservant? Go be with her in the house, you guys be together, that way we will have a lineage, you can raise your son through him, and we see the birth of Ishmael, which was not the promised son that God had designed. Abram takes things into his own hands and pursues it for himself. Fast forwarding to Genesis 17, we get there, Abram now gets a new name. God's doubling down on his promise. Not just exalted father, Abraham, father of many nations. Not just one, not just some father, not just exalted father, father of many nations. This promise is gonna be so big and there's this cool promise that we see in Genesis 17, six that he says there's gonna be kings come through your bloodline. This is significant because we see the perfect sinless savior of the world come through this bloodline. Came from the bloodline of David all tracing back to Abraham, father of many nations. And then an interesting part takes place here where then he says, all right, I wanna make a sign and sealing of this covenant. Um, We're gonna make this thing official, so I want you, Abraham, to be circumcised. Oh, (laughs) a little awkward. Um, I imagine if I'm Abraham, I'm going, can we just have the signing and sealing of the covenant, covenant that Noah had? Like the rainbow, the beautiful rainbow that the earth will no longer be flooded. Like that's a beautiful picture, the circumcision thing. Um, But he says, man, I want you to be faithful and I want you and all of your descendants to be circumcised. That comes up again in Romans 4, why I bring it up now. If you've got questions about uh, circumcision, Dr. John Sorrell, our executive, can answer those after service. Um, I'll leave it at that. So um, 
Come with me now to uh, 913 of the Chair Bibles, Romans chapter four. We're gonna dive back in. That's kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of this Abraham guy. And Paul says, hey, I want your faith to emulate this guy. He's got something that we can learn from. And I think there's three questions that we can ask of this text that help us see a few things. How was Abraham saved? Essentially, how was somebody from the Old Testament saved? Same question. Um, when was Abraham saved? This is an important question for us to ask, and Paul defines it here. And then thirdly, what are some key elements and attributes of Abraham's faith that are worth emulating for us here and now today, thousands of years later, back up the line? So Romans chapter four, first starting with, how was Abraham saved? Chapter four, verse two. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works. Spoiler alert, he's not. We learned that in chapter three. He's not justified by works. He's not made right with God by things that he's done. He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? And now here Paul is quoting Genesis 15, six, the promise that God gave to Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Paul's whole argument kind of in the beginning here that he's working up is he's saying you are not saved by your, righteous, your, your, your works. Those don't make you righteous. You're saved by faith. You receive the gift of righteousness through faith. It's not through your works. How are you saved? Through faith. And he's saying please don't confuse this with compensation. Like this would be as, as if you were to go into your boss um, and say, hey, thank you so much for your gracious generosity that you've just blessed me with in my paycheck. I don't deserve it. And the reality of it is, is like, no, you, can't, you worked for that. Like you should be compensated the hours that you do, whether you have an hourly rate or a salary rate. That's what you're working towards. You work, you get paid. And Paul says, this is not the case. Where does faith come from? And where does faith come to? To the one who does not work. This is a gracious gift from God. Think of it maybe like Christmas morning. Um, in my house, uh, we wake up, we have a wonderful breakfast, and then perhaps a couple tools that are really important for you to have are your hands. Why? Because next you're going to open up your Christmas presents and you receive your Christmas gifts. You have to have hands to receive your Christmas presents. And these presents are not something that you've earned. They're not something that uh, you worked for. They're given to you by somebody who deeply loves you. In the same way, this is like our faith. Our faith is just the tool in which we receive salvation. Just as we receive a gift on Christmas morning, our, our faith does nothing, it doesn't work, it just receives God's gracious gift of righteousness and salvation. That's what Paul wants us to know. How was Abraham saved? How are people in the Old Testament saved? By faith in the promise. They look to God there. And I think there's some common misconceptions. I think we get this a little bit confused sometimes in the church. It's, um, we, we, we work for so many things and we're compensated from so many ways. Sometimes we think like, is it really that easy? Um, Tim Keller, uh, before he had passed, he had, had done a talk on this and he talked about this idea of um, Christians when they're asked the question, if you were to die tonight, um, what would happen to you? Where would you be going? And he's essentially asking the question, um, what are the credentials to get into heaven? Well, what does it take to get there? And he said, commonly I'll hear three different forms and various answers that go something like this. Answer number one, because I have tried my best to be a good Christian. That's, that's nice, but that's faith by works. That's, that's not the answer. You're working, you've tried your best to try to earn God's favor. That's not what faith is about. It's to the worker who has not worked, that has received. Um, number two, Keller would say, because I believe in God, which is a really good start, and I try to do his will. It's faith plus works. Our faith isn't uh, faith in Jesus plus doing really good things like church attendance and tithing and whatever it might be, Sunday school. Um, it's faith and faith alone. Uh, number three, he says, I hear people say, I believe in God with all my heart. I really, really, really have faith. I really try to have faith in God and I really muster it up. And he says, this is salvation as a work. You're working to try to receive something. It's, it's not that way. 
Uh, and I love how Alistair Begg um, addressed kind of this issue. Same question. If you were to die tonight, where would you be going? What would happen to you? What are the credentials? Would it be for you to get into heaven? Um, and he says this. He says, if our answer to that question is ever in the first person, we've gone severely wrong. If we answer when asked, if you were to die tonight, where are you going to go on? Where are you going to be going? And you say, because I, we've neglected the cross. Because I have really strong faith, because I have performed really well, because I have done really good things, because I'm a very moral person. That's gone completely wrong. The only answer, friends, he says, is because he, in the third person, because he, King Jesus, gave his life on the cross, because he, King Jesus, was the worthy sacrifice to pay the debt that I couldn't pay. He, because he, and he goes on to tell this story that you may have heard before about the thieves on the cross, Luke chapter 23. As Jesus is hanging on the cross to pay the debt that we couldn't pay, there's a criminal on each side of him and they start to banter and one guy's like cussing him out like, Jesus, if you're really God, why don't you come off that cross and come down from there and save us? And he's like, dude, this guy did nothing wrong. This guy, Jesus, didn't do anything wrong. We're the criminals. We, we deserve to be hanging on a cross. This guy didn't do anything wrong. And Jesus turns to look at the thief on a cross and goes, today I will see you in paradise. Because of your faith, and if you flesh this out a little bit, um, Alistair Begg talks about this guy entering heaven. Can you imagine what happened to this fellow? Like, he goes into heaven, and the, the angels at the big pearly gates with the book of life, and he's starting to look there, and he goes, oh, thief on the cross. Um, on what basis are you here? And he's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, I was, I, was just on a cro- I was just on a cross, and I, I don't know. Okay. But, but how did you get here? What, why, why are you here? Well, I don't know. And then so the angel leaves and he goes and gets his supervisor and he comes back and the boss man's kind of like, um, do you believe in the doctrine of justification? The, do- the doctrine of what? I have no idea what you're talking, okay, okay. Do you believe in God's word? Do you believe that it is his word that he's spoken? I, I've never read the Bible a day in my life. What do you, I, Okay, sir, on what basis are you here? And the thief on the cross goes, because the man on the middle cross said I could come. Because the man on the middle cross said I could come. Because he, because his work, because what he's done, if as soon as it becomes because I have severely gone wrong and neglected the work of the cross, Abraham was saved by faith. That's when he was credited with righteousness. When was Abraham saved? Um, Paul makes this pretty clear in Romans 4.10. He says this, under what circumstance was it credited? Meaning it, righteousness. Under what circumstance was it credited for Abraham to be righteous? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but it was before. Abraham was saved as soon as he placed faith. He's saying it's not against works. Remember, it's not to the one who's looking to be compensated for the works that he has done. It's the one who does not work, receives this gift from God as the gracious gift that you just have to receive. There's no receiving and believing plus a lot of works. It's just receiving this gift. And I think about that. It's such a beautiful promise for us. Salvation didn't come to Abraham um, after he was circumcised. Genesis 15 was 13 years prior than the signing and sealing of the covenant through circumcision. It was long before there was any religious act to even pursue. And so we can't mess this part up. When was Abraham saved? It wasn't when he was 75 and then God said, well, if you really believe my promise and you leave into the desert and follow me and as long as you don't screw up too many times through the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, then you'll be saved, Abraham. Like that's, that's what's gonna take place. And no, he was He believed and he was credited with righteousness. When was he saved? Immediately. Um, The the next thing uh, that I think is important for us, how was Abraham saved? When was he saved? What elements are key for us to see from his faith and emulate? I love these things I think that we find in the text from Romans four. Um, The first one I think is that Abraham had faith in God's promise. A very specific promise that was given to Abraham. We see this in Romans 4, verse 18. He says, against all hope, Abraham in hope, which is like, dude, what, what he was pe- speaking in these juxtapositions. Like, what, what's happening here? Against all hope, meaning there was no hope. Not like a little bit of hope. Not a, uh, but maybe a potential hope. Like, against all hope. If there was no hope. Why? Because Abraham's body was as good as dead. 
A hundred-year-old man and a wife who's barren, who cannot produce children. Against all hope, Abraham has hope. Hope in what? Abraham hopes in the promise. We read in the rest of the verse, he believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. He hoped, he placed his faith in a very specific promise, so we also place our faith in a specific promise. For Abraham, it was the promise that you will become a great nation, and he's gonna do this great work that you'd bless people on this land and inheritance. He had faith in that very specific promise. Not just, I believe that God's there and I have this general principle. Faith in a specific promise. Verse 21 goes on to say this, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Another reminder from Paul here, it's not by your works. It was credited because of his faith. Verse 23 makes this beautiful bridge to you and I. How are we connected to Abraham? What is this whole thing about? I love this. 23 says, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification we have been made right by God because of our faith, because of what Jesus has done. And what's beautiful here is this is the same thing. Just like Abraham, we too are saved by our faith in the promise. Abraham looked forward to the promise being fulfilled. We look backwards to the promise being fulfilled and we say, Jesus, I have faith when you say that your blood is enough. That's the promise that we look to. We look to the cross and the promise that we are justified and made right by his blood. We look back, Abraham's looking forward. We both have faith in the promise of God. And then I find something kind of comforting here in Abraham's story. In verse 20, um, we see the absence kind of of perfection, but it's said in a little bit of a weird way. We'll, We'll take a look at this with me. It says in verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. And if, if you're familiar with Abraham's story and if you remember kind of the 30,000 foot view from the beginning, like Abraham wavered. What, Paul, what, what, are you, what are you talking about here? Um, in Genesis 12, when he left the land, they ran into some people um, and Abraham was threatened. And the, and the aspect of um, asking who this woman was, his wife, and he's like, she's my sister. Because he feared if he claimed to be his wife, they were gonna kill him because she was beautiful. But if it's just his brother, well, you can have her as, as, as your wife, just keep me alive. This doesn't happen just once, it happens twice. Again, later on in uh, chapter 20 of Genesis, he lies. We also have Genesis 16. Abraham took matters into his own hands, didn't he? I don't see the promised child yet. At 80 some years old, I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna waver, I'm not gonna trust the promise of God, I'm gonna hedge my bets, if you will, and I'm gonna go with this woman, this this slave servant girl from my household and have my lineage that way. Abraham absolutely wavered, so what what is Paul talking about that he says, though he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, he did. Well, he's saying, man, from the place of where Abraham started to where he finished, through the course of life, he kept the faith. It might have looked like this, a lot of ups and downs, but there sure wasn't perfection. And for you and I, that's a beautiful message because it means that you can bring your doubts to God. You have a God that can handle those. We have a God that when you've messed up, like not once, but continually, and you're wrestling in your addiction and your struggles and your temptation. We have a God who says it's not based upon your perfection, it's based upon my promise. The one that I passed through in Genesis 15, I was the only one who went through that. Remember, you're not gonna be able to keep that, but I will keep my promise. That you will be credited with righteousness. Such a beautiful truth. I love what Martin Luther has to say about this passage. He has this, he says, You should consider what the Lord promises Abraham. It is altogether impossible, unbelievable, and untrue if you follow reason, because it it cannot be seen. He was old, and Sarah was barren. 
How I ask you, do these facts agree with the promise, I will make you a great nation? Where are the descendants to come from since Abraham's marriage is childless? These huge masses of unbelief and these high mountains, which could have suppressed his faith completely, sure would have to mine, they um, hold the holy patriarch as he overcomes and crosses by faith. He simply clings to this one thought. Behold, God is promising this. This is built on God's promise. He will not deceive you, even though you do not see a way, the manner, or even the time of the fulfillment of this promise. It's faith in God's promise, and we behold that. I think the second element that we can look to in Abraham's faith that's a key element for us is faith in God's power. I love what Paul has to say in verse 19 of the text. He says this, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. This 100-year-old man, his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Verse 21, being, fulfill, uh, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised He trusted in the promise because God had the power. There's two significant elements of God's power here that are so beautifully woven throughout scripture. Number one, our God is the God of the impossible and he has the ability to bring dead things to life. This is Old Testament stuff that we see themed through and guess what we just celebrated last week at Easter? God bringing dead things to life, rising from the tomb so that you and I no longer have to stay dead. Ephesians 2, we are walking dead men and women, but by God's grace, and to those of us who have faith, we become alive in him as this new, beautiful creation. God, in his power, has the ability to bring dead things to life. Nothing else on the face of the earth has ever even claimed to do that, and God has done it. This other idea, um, uh, ex nihilo, it's this um, term back to Genesis 1, this beautiful meaning that creation from nothing. God created from absolutely nothing. He brought life from nothing. A barren woman and a hundred year old man. Ex nihilo, creation from nothing. We have some beautiful artists in our church, so an amazing group of creative people, but they usually have a paintbrush. They usually have a camera. They usually have various tools to make their art. Our God creates from nothing, and he brings from life out of the dead, the deadness of a 100-year-old man's body. And so as you see this, a beautiful character trait of Abraham is the absence of pride. Can can you just picture this for a moment? A 100-year-old Abraham, probably um, a little hunched over at this point, walking a little bit slower, and imagine he's with the boys. Imagine he's with the boys for a moment, and he says, hey boys, you hear the good news? My girl's pregnant. (laughs) Aren't I awesome? This old man still got it. You know what I mean? Like, like what a ridiculous nature. A hundred-year-old man taking credit for a barren woman and his old dead body to give Life would be ridiculous. There's there's no way. You see the absence of pride in Abraham because in verse 20, where did he give the credit to? Where did he give the glory to? He gave the credit and glory to God. What is Paul's argument in 4, 1 through 8 here? Did Abraham boast in the flesh? Was he boasting because he was saved because of the circumcision? Was it something that he did? No. (laughs) No. He didn't boast in that. He boasted that the fact that he was righteous because he simply received and had faith. He had faith in God's power to create from nothing. He had faith in God's power to bring dead things to life. That's our God, the God of the impossible. And that's what God does in our story. He brings dead things to life. I think the last thing that we see in Abraham's story is this beautiful picture of faith in God's provision. I'll read verse 23 and four again. It says, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone. This isn't just for Abraham. We too have this. Verse 24, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So I thought I'd um, create this analogy here. This term credit uh, is actually like a banking term if you go back uh, to what it is. So I, I brought my son's uh, piggy bank. 
um, full of good money. He's got a really uh, complex password. Um, it's four zeros. And um, he's got like $34 in here or so. Um, lunch money for me today. Um, but uh, he, he's got $34, and he's saved some of his money. Uh, he's earned some of his money. And so say for uh, some crazy reason that Stacy and I happened to pass away this week, um, and instantly overnight, Braden receives our inheritance, and all of a sudden, he's got like $68 in his bank account. It'd be like amazing. <laughs> be like a rich man. And so uh, him going to the playground with the kids going, oh, man, look at this guy's rich today. You know, like taking pride in the fact that he did nothing. Like he did nothing. And God's saying, I have credited your account with righteousness the same as Christ Jesus. You have been made right with me and I see you in the same eyes as my son, the perfect spotless savior of the world. We not only have gone like from down here where it's like, man, in our sin and all of our shame and God has erased that debt, not just to bring us to morally neutral, like we're okay people, credited with the righteousness of King Jesus. We receive that credit through faith, not through our works, so that no one could boast. Only God could do that. And if you've placed your faith in him, he's credited with you. This banking term, you are credited with righteousness only because of your faith and grace alone. Such a beautiful promise for us. But God's provision struck pretty close to Abraham, didn't it? Not only did he end up providing for his son at 100 years old to give birth to this man who would lead this great nation and bless all these people and have this land. Um, Genesis 22 ends up coming, if you know Abraham's story, this account where God ends up testing Abraham. He says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your promised son, Isaac. I want you to take him up the mountain, bring with you some sticks to provide for the fire, and I want you to place your son on the altar. And so this passage that we read about Abraham is going up the mountain and his son Isaac is old enough to kind of go, hey dad, where, where's the sacrifice? Like we, we've got sticks to burn, we've got a knife, where, where's the sacrifice? And what does Abraham, Abraham say? He says, the Lord will provide. He's got faith in the Lord's provision and there's this moment where um, Isaac is laying on the sticks ready for the altar and Abraham pulls out his knife and he's ready to take his own son's life, the promised child of whom generations will come. And in that moment before he takes his life, an angel comes and says, wait, 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 don't do that quite yet. And out of the bushes, a ram appears. The sacrifice that they sacrifice and then they worship the Lord together because our God is a God who provides. He has provided our greatest need. He has provided for you and I the gift of salvation which is received through faith. We are credited with righteousness. But not to be confused, I I think sometimes we think of God's provision, um, maybe in some areas you can take that a little bit too far. Just because we believe in a God who always provides doesn't necessarily mean here and now on this earth we will be prosperous. Doesn't always mean for us prosperity. Um, but but what, what it does mean, I think we can look at this and go, man, my life might be pretty difficult right now. Like I know there's some people whose lives, like man, paychecks are coming in, their family's healthy, everything's going really well, and that's amazing, and if that happens, praise God, but at the same sense, we got people in our church dealing with a ton of stuff. Health problems, loss of loved ones, trouble in marriage, difficulties, families blowing up, hard, hard stuff. It doesn't always equal God's provision, but I think in light of God's provision, there's another promise that we receive. Um, If we might not be prosperous here now on this earth, believing in God's promise at least gives us this, is that our past is redeemed and our future is secure. And I don't know what brings any more peace than the fact that my past is redeemed. All those things that I might feel shame for here now today that I've done or been a part of or wrestle in and through and with, God says, I've taken care of that because you've been credited with righteousness. You no longer have to live in shame. You don't have to live under condemnation because you've been credited with righteousness. And not only like has my past been redeemed, but for those of us who believe in Jesus, our future's secure. You can do nothing for, for your faith to remove, remove you from what's promised for you, which is eternity with King Jesus and God the Father in heaven for all of eternity because of our future being secure, because he's provided a way. And that's his promise. 
And I think about that, it gives me peace. There's some words that Jesus spoke to us in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said this, peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world, um, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We're not promised necessarily prosperity here now on this earth, though there may be blessings. We're grateful anytime that comes, but what we have been promised is righteousness, meaning our past is redeemed and our future is secure. So for those of us like Abraham, we can emulate his faith to believe in the promise that Jesus' blood is enough, to believe in his power that he brings dead things to life and believe in his provision for our lives and for all of eternity. Would you pray with me?